Well, uh, as David's been saying, we, we face uh, many issues and many questions uh, around the policy measures and understanding uh, policy. And uh, our book uh, touches some of the most important aspects and discusses quite a few in detail. But we don't need to say everything about uh, policy in this book. But one thing that we do urge uh, consideration of, and this has been a big theme for the uh, Chronic Poverty uh, Research Centre, is um, that obviously to understand poverty across time, and chronic poverty, <coughs> David says, is very much uh, poverty across generations, across people's lives and across generations, you have to have the right kind of information. And therefore, we've been urging uh, considerable investment in panel data sets, um, tracking um, households and samples of households um, over time. Uh, it's difficult um, to, co to capture chronic poverty uh, without investing in, in, in such information. Um, and of course, uh, one thing that uh, we, we find with existing um, uh, panel data sets is that uh, a lot of panel data that we have at the moment uh, is uh, very much income expenditure measures. It's very much monetary measures, obviously. Uh, there are very few panel data sets that really capture the multi-dimensionality of poverty. And, and we think the, uh, obviously, the multi-dimensional uh, side of um, panel data is, uh, is extremely important um, in the analysis of chronic poverty. And you'll be able to see this, for example, if you think about the, uh, when we're thinking about the, uh, the impact of the, uh, the present financial crisis and the downturn of the global economy on the chronically poor, uh, we'll see effects in terms of their income expenditure, which is at maybe a downfall level, but we'll also see um, effects in terms of the non-income, uh, non-monetary measures of poverty, uh, particularly child uh, nutrition, uh, particularly uh, participation in education, probably a downturn in attendance and schooling by, uh, by uh, females in particular, by girls in particular. Uh, so you'll have that, that multi-dimensionality of the impact of the current um, economic crisis on the, on the chronic people. And to capture that over time, you're going to need uh, multi-dimensional um, data sets. So we think an investment in this uh, is not easy to do. Uh, statistical offices have to be uh, built up, but, but it, it, it uh, yields uh, returns in terms of valuable uh, policy-relevant information. Well, that's the quantitative approach. And alongside that, you very much need the qualitative methods, which is something that also we've been at pains to emphasize in the chronic poverty group. And uh, some of you may have already have seen the work that's been done uh, using life history methods. Uh, life history methods which uh, are tracking key events in people's lives uh, through interviews uh, whereby they correlate um, events that uh, led to their descent uh, or sometimes their exit out of poverty uh, in their lifetimes. For example, uh, in the case of, of poor women that have been interviewed, um, widowhood, uh, then perhaps expropriation of land, uh, uh, quick asset sales at very unfavorable prices. Uh, so you get these descents into poverty. And the life, uh, the life history methods uh, really capture that uh, very well. And Peter Davies' work uh, on uh, on Bangladesh, uh, which is a very good example of the application of, of life history's work, that I, I really would uh, would commend uh, to you. So. Capturing the, um, the time side, the time element of chronic poverty, is not just about quantitative information, it's about bringing quantitative information together with qualitative information, so that we get a really very thorough, thorough understanding of what, what is occurring. David has already mentioned the importance of assets, uh, assets in terms of um, escape from um, poverty traps. Uh, assets have very much uh, come to the fore uh, in the uh, debate around poverty and chronic poverty uh, over the last um, 10 years. But what we've uh, tried to emphasize in this book is that there's a rather um, a social, a historical view of assets, that um, typically economists are rather sort of fond of thinking that uh, the returns to assets are, are relatively unchanging um, over time. And uh, what we've been at pains to emphasize in the book is that assets very much have a, uh, have a uh, social uh, dimension that the value of assets can change uh, quite rapidly due to changes in the society, to changes in the uh, in the global economy. 
one of the examples that we give in the book uh, is an example given by um, Caroline Moser is um, the impact <coughs> of um, trade liberalization in Latin America on the returns that people get as, um, as carpenters. You know, 30, 35 years ago when you were trained as a carpenter and you could produce furniture, uh, that asset, that asset investment in your human capital but also in your business gave you a sort of relatively worthwhile livelihood. And of course, with the, with the globalization, the impact of uh, changes in the global economy, uh, exports of furniture from China, uh, imports of those uh, the Chinese furniture of Latin America has made those skills as a carpenter, uh, an informal worker, uh, less valuable um, over time. But also, climate change is changing the, uh, the social context uh, in which assets uh, function to reduce poverty, uh, and is also changing their economic returns. So again, if you think about, um, for example, uh, Bangladesh. Schemes to transfer um, cattle, cows to um, poor households on the shores, the, the mud islands that exist in, in the rivers. Uh, very worthwhile asset transfer schemes. But, you know, depending upon the extreme scenarios for climate change that we've seen for Bangladesh, is that going to be a useful asset going forward? You know, are in fact we going to see a lot of drowned cows eventually? Or should we actually be investing in human capital? whereby um, poor people from those areas are more effectively able to migrate or to earn a higher um, rate of return in terms of remittance income, you know, if, if uh, they can migrate uh, perhaps um, to, to the Gulf region, as, as many Bangladeshis um, go to that region. So climate change is also changing the context uh, for assets, both the economic return and then the way that society perceives assets. And the, uh, the piece by um, Caroline Bozer in the book um, I very much um, very much commend to you. Well, we've spoken quite a bit about quantitative and qualitative methods. Um, they do have their um, respective um, strengths and um, weaknesses. Um, we're not pushing any one particular uh, line in this book. Uh, let me just summarize um, uh, though one of the advantages of, of quantitative methods which is that they have had, had actually very powerful um, policy impacts. There's a, certainly a resonance among policymakers uh, when quantitative methods are used. Uh, one example you can give is the, um, the cash transfer program linked to education in Mexico, the Opportunidas program, where very thorough quantitative analysis of that program really, and its benefits, which we showed its very strong benefits, helped to sustain that program politically uh, and for successive administrations to build on it rather than seeing uh, you know, that program swept away as the political system in, in Mexico as you had a change of government. So sustaining programs over time, particularly when you can show their quantitative um, benefits, uh, is, is one very valuable aspect of the use of quantitative um, techniques. But we say that you must uh, have alongside those te techniques qualitative and what we're very much working towards in our group is uh, Q-squared methods. But this is not just whereby you have an existing household survey and you go back to that household survey to uh, extract qualitative information. What we want is a true integration of the qualitative and the quantitative methods from the word go. So basically you design your study so that you both have the household study going on but also the application of those qualitative methods either simultaneously before or shortly afterwards. So there's a, there's a true integration. At the moment, quite a lot of the, um, the Q-squared work is, is, in a sense, taking qualitative methods back to uh, uh, surveys that have been done already on, quality, on quantitative uh, uh, survey. Um, we've had a very active debate, a very uh, energetic debate, and it continues um, in the uh, chronic poverty uh, group. Uh, around um, how far quantitative methods can actually uh, illuminate processes of um, the causation of poverty. Um, certainly our colleagues uh, from the more qualitative uh, end of the uh, game uh, have, have been quite critical about quantitative methods. Uh, they've been quite critical of, of economists uh, in terms of, uh, of the uh, conclusions that have been drawn from uh, quantitative household um, surveys. 
Uh, our more robust critics argue that economists are, are operating with quite spurious models of, 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 of scientific knowledge, uh, particularly coming from, from the natural sciences. It's something that we might want to pick up on the, on the discussion that you know that, that hard quantitative analysis is, is uh, and those numbers are in a sense uh, misguiding policy makers uh, as to the true uh, true causation of poverty. Um, certainly, you know the number of studies that you see where you know you have a list of, uh, of characteristics of poor people. Um, you know, poor people are people without assets or very few assets. Um, poor people are people without education. Uh, poor people are people with, with ill health. And you, and you ask, well, you know, what has this quantitative study actually told me that I wouldn't have actually known from um, just wandering into the village and taking a quick look around? Uh, these are the kinds of um, uh, criti critiques that are coming on. And, you know, particularly we've been concerned as a group to understand what is it that drives people's lack of assets? What is the political process or the social process that can block assets, people's access to assets, and indeed dispossess them? In other words, assets are embedded in social relations. You know, they're not sort of um, objectified, um, unsigned, uh, un unsocialized uh, uh, things. I mean, the, the most graphic um, illustration of this came to me um, as, as we were going through um, Bangladesh 10 days ago. We were visiting um, urban slum communities um, and uh, really trying to understand the nature of urban poverty in Bangladesh. Um, and understanding whether the donor-led efforts and the efforts of social movements in Bangladesh are being effective in creating new assets for poor people and transferring assets. And time and time again, you come up against this issue about dispossession of poor people in the limited amount that they have by wealthier groups in society. You know, if you go to Dhaka, and some of you may have been to Dhaka, there you have a, a city where, where land is, is, is in extremely short supply, uh, poor people are very much pushed to the margins, lifted to the margins of the water, and then they're dispossessed of even the little, the few assets that they have. So there you have, you know, access to assets embedded very much in a, in a social process, which is to the disadvantage of chronically poor people. It is to the disadvantage of them politically. And that's something that we discuss a great deal in the book, and indeed in the chronic uh, poverty report, which I recommend to you. Okay, so what are we concluding from this? Um, well, we're concluding that, as David says, the dynamics of poverty um, are absolutely crucial. Um, there are major uh, conceptual problems that we have to break through. Um, one problem that we face when we look at um, poverty over time is the sense in which how do you value um, ethically uh, different spells of poverty, or what economists uh, say, how do you uh, how do you construct the welfare function? So, you know, if, if you've been in poverty for um, five years in your past, you give that an equal value to being in, in poverty in the next five years. Uh, if you emerge out of poverty, um, do you, do you say that that, um, in terms of your poverty measure? carries greater weight than the previous period that you spent in poverty. This actually has quite an important policy dimension, because if you think about it, uh, policymakers often say to societies, and they say to the population when they're, when they're trying to convince them of, about the merits of a particular policy reform, they often say to societies, well, you know, you're going to experience some pain in the short term, but there are going to be lots of long-term gains, right? But chronically poor people are often the, the least able to bear the short-term pain, because they're already at that minimum threshold, particularly when you have effects such as on child nutrition, which are not, not reversible, when, when, lack, when malnutrition leads to um, loss of um, cognitive ability in children and child development. Um, if that's a short-term pain for a long-term gain, well, you know, the, the things are not commensurate. So these are very important um, policy issues issues that we might come back to, and of course will resonate very much in the, in, in, in the way in which governments deal with the, with the, um, the uh, current uh, economic crisis that's uh, steadily gripping the world, because there'll be a lot of governments, you know, with assistance from the donor community and so on, who are going to enact the typical range of economic reforms, and they're going to say, well, you know, short-term pain for long-term gain. Um, 
<coughs> you'll see, obviously, if you read the, uh, the uh, Chronic Poverty Report, CPR2, we say a great deal about social protection. Uh, we're very firm in saying that you need to really embed social protection rather than just patch it on to societies. And nowhere is this more evident now in dealing with the, um, with the uh, present um, crisis. And what you're going to need around your social protection programs is good systems of evaluation, of understanding the effects of those social protection programs, and therefore what you're going to need are qualitative and quantitative methods, and those need to be set up now, those processes to really understand what's effective and indeed what works. <coughs> They're going to be multi-dimensional, multi as we've emphasized. They're going to include the time element, duration adjusted, adjusted is the piece of jargon to be used. And finally, <coughs> We've seen that um, quantitative methods and qualitative methods have, have tended to talk too much past each other. Uh, economists hold the conferences where every paper contains, you know, uh, endless lists of equations and numbers. <coughs> Sociologists hold conferences where all the debate is about social relations and post-structuralism. We're saying we need a genuine conversation uh, across those disciplines. And it's hard. It's very hard to do. We can't underestimate that. Um, you know, when I listen to my, my colleagues from, from the other disciplines, I'm an economist, and you know, I try to understand uh, what they say. Um, you know, uh, what is you know, ontological, uh, and, uh, what is, what is post-structuralism, uh, you know, what are social relations? Um, these are concepts that, I, that don't come naturally to me as, a, as an economist. When they hear me rambling on about you know, the P-alpha measure or the tile measure of inequality, equally it's a strange and foreign language. And, you know, we need uh, more effective processes of translating between each other so that we do get that very effective uh, Q squared uh, uh, discussion and conversation. That's very important for policy. You know, we must emphasize that um, all of this must be for the design of better policies that help poor people and better help to social movements that help poor people. So while it may appear very technical at times, very academic, this is all about understanding how societies function and how we track progress over time, which is ultimately a political action. So data is political, information is political. So that's the sort of last message that uh, we very much want to give you from this book. Okay, thank you. Um, um, you might go to the